that last song was was perfect for me to get started with. And it is um, that I am Dave's mom. And sometimes I think it's hard uh, for David. When Michael asked me, he wrote me a letter and asked me about um, speaking. And I asked David, um, Pastor Dave, I said, well, what do you think? I don't want to embarrass you. And he said, <laughs> Well, Mom, that's all right. You've already embarrassed me before, so go ahead and do it. So I have a sign up here that says, go slow, because when I get nervous and excited, I, my tongue works before my brain sometimes. And um, yesterday, women will understand this. Our house is in utter chaos because we are getting uh, different siding, different windows, everything. So. It's chaos. So I went to Walmart and I bought a plant. And I thought, if I put that new plant up, nobody's going to notice. There's no trim. There's no anything else. <laughs> I was so nervous, I left my wallet in the parking lot at Kmart in the cart. Now, nobody is going to tell me that that wasn't my savior, my helper, whatever, that when I went back to Walmart, there it was. If I said Kmart, I meant Walmart. But that cart was right where I left it. Nobody had taken my purse. Nobody had taken anything. Last night, I lost my glasses. Couldn't find my glasses. I'm saying the devil has been at work. Um, I've never spoken before an audience. Uh, the devil has brought it upon me that I got my hair cut too short. One woman said, my face looks this big. <laughs> now I'm up here thinking, my face. I bought a new dress for the occasion. The devil says it looks like a couch cover. <laughs> Not a chair cover, a couch cover. But last night when I was cleaning the cupboard by the telephone, as a new Christian, and when you're older, you can't remember the verses. That's why I say praise God to the Sunday school teachers who the little kids learn the verses when they're young. Amen. I have to have mine on paper. And this is what I found. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen. 2 Timothy 1.7. The other one is Jeremiah 17.5. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord whose confidence is in him. Yeah. So when I talked to David and got Mike's letter, Brother Bill Parsons, who uh, you, you that know him know he has a beautiful spirit and such a wonderful attitude, always a positive attitude. That's what I want to strive for. And when I mentioned it to him, he said, oh, Sister Norma, you're going to do fine. You're going to do fine. So. David told me, uh, and we prayed about it in Yoke, for me to be discerning. So I got out my dictionary, and I looked up discerning. And what discerning says is revealing insight and understanding and being discriminating. So I looked up insight in the dictionary, and it says, means the power or act of seeing into a situation. See discernment. So there it is again. Understanding means knowing, intelligent, comprehending, see discernment. Discrimination, making a distinction, see discernment. So I always say, if you know me, you know I say, let's get to the bottom line. You know, let's not pass the buck. Get to the bottom line. The bottom line is, watch my mouth. Let my brain work before my mouth. And as we said before, I am David's mom. And sometimes people put a minister's mother in a little cubicle. And David was born to save me, so I'm not some pastor's mom that um, knows every verse, knows every scripture you talk about. If you're talking to me about something and I look completely blank, it's like, I don't understand that yet. Um, David did not have the good fortune of having a mother and father. Um, that were saved. Yeah, we'll just put it that way. My other son, our other son is the doctor, and when we are around that situation, they think of me as Dr. Don's mother, which puts you in a cubicle. But what I love about the Lord is that I'm me, and I was able to stay me. 
I was lost in sin. I was headed straight for hell. And now I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I know I'm going to heaven, but I'm still me. And there's a quote I like that says, there will be only one of you in all time. That identity is canceled if you are not always fearlessly yourself. So when Mike said about testimony, I looked up the word testimony too. And Webster says that testimony is a witness or evidence, a statement testifying to benefits received. And I can definitely testify to benefits received because I'm a child of the king. A public profession of religious experience. In our Bible dictionary, it says, commonly among Christians, the statement of one's Christian experience. So that's what I'm going to tell you today, my Christian experience, and it's my life, and it's my opinion. So if we disagree with each other on something, we can, we can discuss that when we get to heaven. There's little, little disagreements. I consider myself a baby in Christ, and I'm speaking to people that are in graduate school. So last year when you people came, I was just overwhelmed. I was a new Christian, and I came, and I was just like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, I, whoa. Well, as we grow, I'm getting it more. I'm learning more. I'm learning more. And when I say that I feel that David was born to save me, when David came, he was, a, all our children are special. David was special. David always had it easy in that um, he's good looking. He gets that from his father's side of the family. He's intelligent. He gets that from my side of the family. <laughs> um, in school, he didn't, have to, he didn't have to study. He had friends. He had dates any times he wanted. He had it made, people would say, in the world. But he was bound for hell just, just like us. And along came a young lady named Jill. And David asked her out, and she refused. It was like, wow, this girl, you know, yeah, she refused. Now, I don't know the exact words, but the way I get it is she told him, there's no way, you're bound for hell. So he, what he did is he went to her church. So his dad and I were kind of concerned because when you're not church folk, you wonder about these other churches. So we asked about the church, you know, what is it, what it's like. We didn't know, you know, chickens in there, snakes, you know, whatever. It's the church at 78th and Independence. Okay, what is that? Is that Baptist? Is it, you know, Methodist? Is it Presbyterian? You know, what is it? It's the church at 78th and Independence. And he did. He became a religious fanatic. And when you're under conviction and you're living in a home with a religious fanatic, he would borrow my car and I would have country western music on. It would be the religious stations. I had to know how to press those buttons. Da -da 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 -da. Every time I got in that car, I heard something I was doing you know, right there. Hurry up. I even told his father, he's not driving my car anymore if he doesn't leave my stations alone. Well, now I listen to those stations, and I get such, such a blessing from hearing those stations. Well, David and Jill got married. They, he, then he decided to be a minister, and we're like, wow. Well. So then he goes to Missouri, into Kansas, and we go down to visit. And I don't think Jill even realizes this. One time we went down, it's 10 hours drive to get there. And we took him out for supper. We had a good time. The next day in Sunday school in class, she makes the statement that if you're not with Christ, you're no better than a slug. And a slug is the lowest thing on earth. Well, here I am sitting in class holding Becca, and I'm under conviction already, and I'm thinking, we just took them out for supper. We just <laughs> took them out. And on the way home, I'm talking to Don. We're a slug. Do you know what a slug is? But isn't that wonderful that Jill was able to be that outspoken? I feel that, that without Jill, there would be no da saving of David. And without David, there would be no saving of his father and I. I just say, praise God. Amen. So we're talking on the phone one day, and he's in Kansas. And he's saying, um, 
Well, Mom, if we, if, um, we got any closer, would uh, y you go to church? And I said, sure, because it's 10 hours away. <laughs> well, next time I know, he's got a church in Calumet City, which is only 45 minutes away. And as parents, when you tell your children something, you like to, to, to do it. So we decided to go to that church. So the first day we walk in, we have to walk through people that's smoking. And then when we get into the church, we find out that's the elders and deacons. <laughs> so you know, when you're under conviction, man, you've got that going. And, and the people are mad at each other. One was mad since 1953 at another one. So then you're thinking, well, I'm not so bad, you know, I'm not so bad if they're like this. But in Matthew 7, it says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why, you, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the blank plank in your own eye? And I looked up the word plank, and that means log. So if you can picture a log in your eye, how can you see that sawdust in another person's eye? So I feel very strongly that as Christians, we leave the judging to someone else. The one time in, in David's um, church at Calumet City, he said, don't sing if you don't mean it. And there's a lot of church songs that people just and you can see sometimes, and that really hit me, and I thought, he, he can see if my lips are, you know. <laughs> and the song was, I Surrender All. And I started out pretty good, and I thought, I know, he can, you know, he can see. But what I'm saying now is, as a Christian, I love that song. And what I'm saying is, um, I'm not going to become one of these people that uh, dance in the aisle or shout. But I have asked David before. He said, it's all right. I am going to put my hand up. I am going to put my arm up. I have been more vocal in saying amen and getting a little more amen, amen. But to these words of this song is, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. In his presence daily live. How can you not get excited? How can you not? Where's that smile on your face? You know, humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. Isn't I mean, I just love it. And the last verse is, Lord, I give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessings fall on me. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. How can you not? Get that on, you know. I was always told that I was good, that I did nice things to people, that I, that I was a good person. I was headed straight for hell as a good person. And sometimes I think good people that are called good people, we're going to find out there's more of them there than mass murderers. This is just my opinion I'm saying because... Good people think they're all right. I was not all right. I've always believed in Christ, but when I didn't do anything about it, I was denying him. I was doing it the same as Peter. I was helping put the nails in his hands. So when good is not good enough, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Amen. 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 Now when I, when I was eight years old, at some time I went to a, a Baptist um, Sunday school by bus. I still have the Bible. I still think, why do I still have the Bible? Do it, does everybody keep these Bibles? Are we, uh, you know, are we afraid to get rid of them or is there... You know, is it the Lord's plan that I'm not seeing? And when I was about 13 or 14, I went to the Maryville Church of Christ. And I was baptized. But I don't feel I was baptized. I feel I got wet because I did not have, I did not have the right 
ex I did not have the right attitude. I did not have, I went because we could have pizza after the meetings at Al's Pizza. Those of you that now you have children, you go out to eat all the time. When we were growing up, we didn't do that. So it was a big thing that when we could go somewhere and then we could go out later. I was babysitting at the time, so I had money. So it was a big thing to me that I could go to church one night a week. And then after that meeting was over, we went to Al's Pizza and had pizza. So I didn't have the right frame of mind. I just got wet. And I mean, shame on me. That's a horrible thing, but that's what I did. Uh, when we got married, we went to the Nazarene Church. That's the church my husband was raised in. At the Nazarene Church, you go down, an al down to the altar. When you have revivals, you have men that are very outgoing in um, describing to you what happens if you don't go. You know, like if you go out that door, a truck or a bus is going to hit you. And, and they don't ever say just a little car or a motorcycle, it's a bus or a truck is going to, and then your mother is going to be, so, you know, and the, the wheel is going to be broken. And the bad part is, is when they say every head bowed, nobody turning around. But if you feel for someone, you've been praying for someone, just touch them on the shoulder. So you're like, oh, I know somebody's coming. So I went down the altar before somebody tapped me on the shoulder. And when I was down there, I didn't feel anything. I wasn't praying right. The people were praying for me, and I kept thinking, they're going to think, you know, what's taking so long? What's taking so long? So I stood back up, you know, and that's, that was that experience. But Jill won't remember this, but one day at Calumet City, we all would sat in the same row. We'd sat in the same row. And David had the invitation him, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw Jill get up, and I thought, oh, she's coming to tap me on the shoulder. Oh, but she just went up to play the piano. So it was like, so this is how this was going on in my life. And most of you here know how it was that God brought David to this church. You could just tell by the way things happened. He, they came from Kansas to Calumet City, there were some bad experiences, but there was some learning, and he got closer and to hear about, about this church. They came to this church. Our first Sunday here was April 20th. During the next week, I say, I saw Jesus. I was in bed April 30th, 1997, 2.25 in the morning, and something woke me. Something was on my bed. I felt it on my bed, at the foot of my bed, something on my foot. I was not sleeping. I was not drug-induced. I say he was there. I felt such peace, such love, such forgiveness. It's, it's indescribable. Um, I got up and I looked in parts of the Bible and I heard, I read uh, 1 Corinthians, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him, but God has revealed it to us by his spirit. Psalms 34, 4, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. And if people could just realize that fear is gone. You don't have to live with that fear, what's going to happen from day to day. And that happened April 30th, and we came the next Sunday to David's new church and the people. And the devil during the week was telling me, you better not tell that. They're going to think David's mother's nutso, you know. And we have a testify of praise and worship we had. And I thought, if I don't stand up and praise the Lord, I'm denying him. Every time we do this, we're denying him. So I stood up and told of my experience. And people still talk to me. They don't act like I'm nutty or anything. But I did find out in that first year as a Christian, God is a jealous God. Exodus 33:16. Do not worship any other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, 
is a jealous God. And Don and I will be married 40 years in April, and I've always said, I don't know how, he's my life. I put it that way. I would always say, he's my life. I don't know what I would do without, without him. And that's wrong. God is number one. God is always number one. We cannot put any earthly thing, if it's our children or anything, ahead of him. And the way it was brought to me was that we were going to go for a ride the Sunday after church, but we do volunteer work the Saturday night. Don works in the ER at the hospital. The Lord made it the easiest possible for us. Don got sick in the ER at the hospital, not on the ride the next day where we wouldn't know where we would be. He got sick in the ER where the doctors and the nurses knew him and could take, take care of him the best. So he was in the hospital overnight, and I've never been home alone in that my generation, we left our parents' house and went to our husband's house. We didn't have homes and apartments ahead of time. So this is the first time of being alone. So I prayed to the Lord, you know, help me to see your will. It's not my will. I know you have a different plan. But if it's your plan that I'm going to be without Don, I can handle it. I, I can handle it. The next morning when I went to the hospital, there had been a mix-up, a miscommunication. I thought Don was in his room. He was in nuclear medicine having a code blue. And those of you that know code blue, that's not good. That means you're out, they're working on you. I went racing to the elevator and I thought, Lord, this is really fast. You know, I just said that last night. If it's your will, you know, I can handle it, but you know, this is really fast, but I can do it. I can do it with you. I can do it. And I was in the elevator alone, and I felt arms around me. I was not, I was not alone. And the happy thing is, is that Don's medically okay, and I learned a lesson. Who to put first? Who to put first? Now, this radio station that I always turned I listen to now all the time, and what I like is what they said is, we have, as Christians, have become wimps in that we are not vocal enough to say, we're so afraid we're going to hurt somebody's feelings. We don't say homosexuals anymore, we say people with a gay lifestyle. We don't say people are committing adultery, we say they're having an affair. So my opinion is that we need to get back to where we can, we can speak out and say, you know, that's not right. I can love the sinner, but I, I can't love the sin. I, this, we can't be wimps about this. There's a, there's a book out that David told us about called The Case for Christ, and it's by Lee Strobel. He's a journalist for the Chicago Tribune, and he was a, a formal former spiritual skeptic and now he's a teaching pastor in the Chicago area. I highly recommend this book and what I say is when I read this book you can see what Christ did for me. There's a medical exam, he, what he does is he, he went to all kinds of doctors and medical examiners to get to the facts how some people have actually said that Christ just fainted and that he went somewhere else to live. There are people writing this garbage, you know, garbage. Well, this medical examiner, Dr. Stein, has performed over 20,000 autopsies. And he said there is no way that what happened to Christ, no one could live. And what I'm saying is we worry about if it's too hot, if it's too cold, if it's too dark to come to church, you know, if there's this or that, what's wrong? But this is what I'm telling this is what Christ did for us. Some people said that he had fainted from exhaustion and was later revived. But this Dr. Stein says, no, he was dead. He died for you and me. This is what he did for us. Dr. Marathal is a physician. He studied historical, arche archaeological, and medical data. And after the Last Supper, when Christ went to the Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prayed all night, he knew the pain he was going to have to endure. 
he was experiencing a great deal of psychological stress. Known medical condition called is like H-E-M-A-T-I-D-R-O-I-S. It's not common, but it actually happens. The severe anxiety causes the release of chemicals that break down the capillaries in the sweat glands. So there is a small amount of bleeding in the glands and the sweat comes out tinged with blood. It makes the skin to be extremely sensitive and fragile. So that when he was flogged, that skin was already fragile. And when he was flogged, he got at least 39 lashes. That's what, that, that's what they would give, 39 lashes. And the whip was braided leather thongs with metal balls woven into them. And the whip would hit the flesh. The balls would make bruises or contusions. And those would break open. And the whip also had pieces of sharp bone in it. So then the back would be shredded. That part of the spine was exposed. And the whipping was from the shoulders down the back, buttocks, and back of the legs. He did this for us. He knew what he was doing the night before when he prayed. He knew this. The lacerations would tear into the skeletal muscles and produce ribbons of bleeding flesh. The veins were laid bare, and the muscles and bowels were open to exposure. Then he went into shock hypolemic shock. That means low volume of blood. He was bleeding so much it was shock. First the heart races to try to pump the blood. Then your blood pressure drops causing fainting. Then your kidneys stop producing urine. And then you become very thirsty. You remember when Jesus was in, he was in shock as he staggered up the road to Calvary. He wasn't even on the cross. He was carrying it up to Calvary. He said, I thirst and he was given a sip of vinegar. We think of death nowadays, it's like a surge of electricity and it's over. When Jesus was laid down, his hands were nailed outstretched. The spikes were five to seven inches long and tapered to a sharp point, driven through the wrist. It's not the hand, it's through here. Because if it's through here, when he's up on the cross, it would go through. It was through here. In those days, they called this whole part the hand. So it's right in the Bible when they say that. And this nerve in here is the median nerve. It's the largest nerve to the hand. That's crushed by the nail. And he describes it as like your funny bone. If you took your funny bone and you took a pair of pliers and you squeezed it and crushed the nerve, it's unbearable. In fact, they even made a new word called excruciating. That's, that's out of the cross, excruciating pain. The nerves in the feet were crushed. Immediately the arms stretched six inches. Both, soldier, both shoulders were dislocated. In, pa, in Psalms 22, it was foretold that the crucifixion hundreds of years, it was foretold before, my bones are out of joint. To breathe, he had to push up on his feet and so then after you can't do that, you go into this respiratory problem. And that's when, and then you get an irregular heartbeat. And that's when he said, Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he died of cardiac arrest. Now there was the collection of fluid in the membrane around the heart. And the soldier pierced him. And in John 19.34, John said, blood and water. And they even say that... It was the water first, but in ancient Greek words, not every sequence, the words were put by prominence, not sequence. So it's all, all you can see this is true. And this is what Christ did for you and me, and it's like, what do, what do we do for him? So I, I'm like in a race. I'm an older racer. I've started the race late. I can see the, I can see the finish line. In Hebrews 12, it says, run with perseverance, the race marked for us. And sometimes we stop along the race, and sometimes there's people in a, a chair just sitting there. But what we need to do is keep going. Whether Some days I feel it's two steps forward and I went back, but, but we have to keep going. And in 2 Timothy, it's... I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Between the date on a headstone is that little dash. And what we do in our life 
That's what is in between that little dash. And we make a mark in this world. And so what I want to be remembered for is, I don't want to be remembered as a downer person that was upset about little piddly things. I want to be remembered as an upper. I, w I want to re be remembered that when somebody saw me, they remembered something um, optimistic, I guess you'd say. And I'm constantly being transformed and growing because that's what we do when we're in Christ. Constantly growing. And what I would have said last year, I don't say anymore because I, there's, you know, I can just see like a piece of, um, I'm being made into like a vase or something. And that chip has to go. That didn't, you know, no. And in Galatians it says, the entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. And in Galatians, Paul also says, so I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And we all know the sinful nature, the hatred, the jealousy, the envy, the drunkenness, the discord, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, amen. amen. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's it. I'll see you in heaven if I don't see you before. <laughs>